Hey guys, welcome back. Now, before we start today's episode, I want to tell you a funny story. When I started recording this episode, I was using a new platform I had never used before to record it. It was an amazing episode. We had so much fun. I loved and enjoyed every second of this, but I'd never used the platform before. And so I found after the episode had been recorded with my guest that I had used the wrong microphone on accident. So the microphone sounded really bad. It was high pitch, it was echoey, it was just absolutely terrible. It was a disaster. And so instead of using this microphone with the nice audio like I normally do, I was just using my earbud microphone or like a phone or somewhere and it was just distanced, it was gross. <laughs> so I get off and I'm like, oh man, the entire episode was just recorded and I had really bad sound quality. So I haven't released this episode nearly as soon as I wanted to. Because of that, I was trying to make it sound better inside of my audio editing software, my DAW, for those of you who make music, because I do produce music, I love doing it, and so I, thankfully I have those technical skills. And with the power of AI, I've really been able to pull this together, and so I'm glad to present you with my episode with Jim Ramos from the Men in the Arena podcast. We're going to talk today about all sorts of things that apply directly to you as a young man, things you really need to be paying attention to right now as you're going into your next stages of life, as you're figuring things out, especially for the most of you listening right now are between the ages of 18 and 23. That's a really crucial time for us. We're graduating, we're going to college, we're taking the next steps in our life. Some of us might even be dating. And so we really need to make sure that we're doing the things right because as Jim is going to reveal, and this is an amazing, amazing point that he had, the things we do now make a lot of difference down the road. And so we really need to be careful because it's much bigger of an impact than we would ever think. So I also want to shout out to his team because Scheduling this thing was incredible. They were all <laughs> super nice. Jim and I had actually never spoken before, before this podcast episode. So everything was seamless when it came to setting everything up. So it was an amazing episode and I hope you enjoy. All right, welcome back everyone to Making Men, the podcast for young men. I'm your host, Isaiah Keen. And today I am actually really excited to introduce Jim Ramos, who is the founder and podcast host of Men in the Arena. And this is a podcast I've listened to for a long time. He does a lot of the same stuff, talks about a lot of the same stuff as I do. And so I am super excited to introduce him. How are you doing today, Jim? Hey, I'm doing great, Isaiah. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm honored. Yeah. All right. I have a couple of questions for you because you are exactly who the people listening to this podcast are going to want to model, emulate when it comes to choosing biblical and masculine role models and leaders. You're one of those guys. Well, appreciate and so I, I have a couple questions for you today, and I would just love to get your insights on them because there are so many things going around in modern culture right now that mm -hmm. just create a ton of confusion for a, a lot of people across the board. Yeah. And so I'm all about cutting out, clearing the static, let's just say, all right, let's get back to the Bible, back to the basics, and just talk about, well, what does this actually mean? Because we've come to a point where things got crazy, and now we're trying to take that back. So today I have a couple questions for you. And as always, it's just an amazing conversation. So first, I'd love to know a little bit about what brought you to creating this ministry and your podcast and the things you do. Yeah, that's a great question. So I was <clears throat> radically called into ministry as a 19-year-old. I had a knee surgery from a football injury and I got overdosed by the anesthesiologist and I went into an anaphylactic shock situation in code blue and I ended up having my eyes swollen shut for three days and so when I was in ICU I was not living for Jesus. I had accepted Christ about a year before but I had no idea what that meant. I remember God spoke clearly to me for the first time and said I want you to make a difference in the lives of teens. I was a teenager at the time. And so I changed my major. I started working with uh, autistic kids. I would uh, work eight hours a week as a volunteer, driving one hour each way to work with autistic students. And I really fell in love with that. And after that, I ended up working with incarcerated teenagers. And then slowly as I morphed into a devoted follower of Jesus, God called me into ministry with high school students through an organization called Campus Life. So I did that, and then that morphed into church ministry, and I basically was in full-time ministry working with teenagers from 1990 until 2012 when 
God began to change my heart, and I, I knew something was going on, but I wasn't sure what it would mean or cost me. And so I actually sat down, and I thought, okay, Lord, who did you make when you made Jim Ramos? And I realized that when I walk into a room or I walk into the gym, guys go, hey, what's up? You know, I, I get like this man respect just because of the stature. But as a youth pastor, I would scare kids. <laughs> They're like, you're scary. You know, tell me like, so once they got to know me, everything was great. But I thought naturally men are attracted to me in a, in a normal way. And then I, I thought, okay, when I speak, who do I speak to? And I realized I resonate with men. When I would speak to men at my church, they would respond. In youth ministry, it's really hard to get a response because, you know, it's youth ministry. You know, you're kind of building into the future. And I just, and I thought, what are my passions? What are my passions? Everything that kind of lined up. I realized, and I was about 44 years old at the time, 45. I realized that everything that had, that I considered lined up with men and not youth ministry. I remember sitting in this coffee shop going, well, Lord, you called me radically to work with teenagers. What's going on? And he said, and, and I felt like God spoke to my heart and said, I have just changed your heart. Now go work with men, which, which I was so excited about. So I feel like that youth ministry season in some way was a season of obscurity, which we see a lot in the Bible. And then God released me to work with men because that's what I'm really passionate about. Because I, I noticed as a youth pastor, one of my biggest struggles was actually not the teenagers, but it was the disengaged dads, absent dads, dads who were workaholics. And so once I realized the problem with the youth ministry was, was fathering, that's when I thought, okay, I need to go headlong into this thing. Because if we can fix the men, we can fix the families. Because when a man gets it, everyone wins. But when a male doesn't, everyone loses. And so, and I do differentiate between man and male. So that's my story. That's why I got into men's ministry. And we ended up launching this ministry. It was initially called the great hunt for God based out of Philippians chapter three, verse 14, where Paul says, I press on that word in the Greek is dioko. It's a Greek word that means hunt. It's a hunting word or a, a track word that means to chase or pursue. So I thought, okay, we're going to help men pursue God. And then what happened is I found myself explaining what the great hunt for God was so much. I thought I need to have a word picture to really call men into the game. So men in the arena came about from a speech by Teddy Roosevelt in 1910. And an excerpt of that speech is called men in the man in the arena. And, you know, so we took that, we went into that and, and that really has been a game changer for us because it gives guys a word picture. Hey man, it's time to get out of the anonymous bleachers and get into the game. So that's, the short 411 for you. <laughs> that is awesome. That is the beginning of every podcast episode that you guys have. And yeah, so for sure. Having Actually, having that context is cool now because I can think like, I hear it. I know what it's talking about. And like, okay. That makes sense. Well, then I'll tell you something. Since you, so, so, that, so when we did the podcast intro, I wanted it to sound <clears throat> like Teddy Roosevelt. I wanted it yeah. to sound like an old radio crackling in 1910. So I I, got, I reached out to a friend of mine who does voiceovers. His name is Ange Canessa. He's out of uh, Tennessee, and he put that all together for me as a volunteer. So I thought it turned out really good. And that's his voice, and he altered his voice. It's really, really good. So I'm really proud of that intro. That is so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you – that's cool. So, so just for context, everyone, like we have, Jim and I have not had a lot of like back and forth or conversation yes. up to this point. So I'm learning about him now just as much as you guys are. Yep. So I have a brother like with special needs, sister with special needs, and you were working with the special needs kids. And that's yes. really cool. I think that provides, I know at least for me, that has provided a lot of clarity where other people my age have not had that. And it created a very lonely and isolated world for me where yeah. my peers did not get the same things like that I got. And I, I had a heart for like my family and my siblings who needed help. And I heard Jordan Peterson talking about this and he was talking about kind of what you're saying, where there's a difference between a man and a male. Because yep. we're all born as males you know, those of us that are born as males, but being a man is a choice. And I founded this podcast. The very first episode, when you go back, is called The Choice. Oh, cool. And The Choice is like this philosophical, theoretical of 
every single day you have billions of decisions you get to make and in each in each one of those decisions you get to make the choice to be a better person to be more like Christ and so i was making that choice i was like 9 and jordan peterson was talking about how there's a, a level of growth for adults when they become parents because they realize that they're they begin focusing on people other than themselves and that creates that man masculine mentality where suddenly i'm a caring for people i'm providing i'm protecting you know i'm mm-hmm. putting others before myself and it's really a, a death to self and so obviously my night was like it's not that serious it's not that complex or complicated but it's it's a good picture of like okay we get to live in this way that we're called to step up and actually be men and not just males. So with that in mind and in perspective, there is a massive fad going around right now. And you've probably heard of it. It's kind of like the premise for both of our podcasts, biblical masculinity. Yeah. And it's, it's a really big deal right now. Or toxic masculinity, you know, just gender roles, all the, all the crazy stuff that's on the internet right now. And so I would love some of your insight as someone who's actually been in this for a long time, longer. Your podcast is literally older than the people that are on the internet right now and the posts that are out on the internet. So I'd love to know some of your perspective behind this idea and this fad of biblical masculinity. Yeah, there's two things I'll say that. So I wrote a book on it. It's a number one bestseller on Amazon. It's right there, Strong Men, Dangerous Times. I just got back from a, a trip down to California where I, I spoke on that five different messages during a one day explaining what that is. But I'm going to get back to that. I'll start with this. Uh, so toxic masculinity is a coin phrased from people who are antithetical to Jesus Christ. It is a political phrase and it is oxymoronic. So here's why here. And this is really it, it cracks me up because a lot of this is coming out of academia. And I'm like, dude, this is academia, and you guys are being oxymoronic. If you would educate yourselves, it might help you a little bit in your attack against Christianity and men. So here's what I'll say. So I, I, anyway, here's what I'll say. If you look up the word masculinity in the dictionary, it says doing things that are manly. it's, It's doing and involving yourselves in things that are manly. So, a masculine man who is doing things that are manly are things like loving your wife, loving your kids, serving your community, helping the poor, helping those with special needs, sending money overseas, helping with people with foreign missions. So the things that are manly are the opposite of toxic. So the people that are toxic are males, not men. Men are not toxic. Males are toxic. And what we need to realize is is just because I, I I can pee standing up, right? Just because I can, you know, I've got a penis, that does not mean that I am a man. That means I am a biological male. No matter what my brain thinks I am, I'm a male. But I become a man by choice. So I can revert to maleness in a choice, right? And so, but manhood is is the choice to do things that are manly. They are not toxic. That's what males do. Our our country, our world is damaged by males, not men. And as men go, so goes the cult, so goes the culture. And the problem is men are getting a bad rap for males. And I understand the confusion there. It's the men, you know, males have caused the problems, but the men are the solution. So that's I'll say about that. As far as biblical masculinity, we've got to be really careful with this because I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. I believe the Bible is true, Hebrews 4, 12. I mean, many, many verses in there. So if I believe the Bible is true, if I believe Jesus is true, then biblical masculinity, now let me hear, listen to this, Isaiah. Biblical masculinity, if it is indeed true, it has to be true across the board. It has to be true for a man who lived in 1720. It has to be true for a man who lives in 2520. It has to be true for a man who 
is Hindu or Muslim or Mormon, and it has to be true for a Christian. I'm going to get back to that in a second. It has to be true for a guy who's 19. It has to be true for a guy who's 99. It has to be true uh, for a guy who lives in Africa. It has to be true for a guy who lives in Australia. So if it's really true, if biblical masculinity is really true, it has to transcend time, geography, race, age. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So when we, when we came up with this biblical masculinity, we thought, okay, we need a definition of masculinity that would really transcend all those things. Now, at first, Christians go, whoa, 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 don't put me, don't put me in the same box as a you know an Islamic guy or a Hindu guy. But let me let me explain. There are certain components that make a man different than a male. And so if you look at if you're kind of climbing a mountain and you're kind of going down the other side. What we've determined, and me and my team, and, and years and years of going through this with non-Christian guys and Christian guys asking different groups, I believe that the foundational aspect of manhood, the trailhead of manhood down here, is protecting integrity. I mean, if you don't have integrity, you know, if our political officers don't have integrity, it ruins them, right? Integrity is critical, critical, critical for men. It's not only foundational for man. But it's the functional component by which a man lives. You know, the Bible says that Job was a man of complete integrity. He was blameless and upright. So he was able to stand upright. You quoted Jordan Peterson earlier. Jordan Peterson also wrote in one of his books that human beings are the only species on the planet that are meant to walk upright with our sex organs exposed. So, so when we sin, when we lose integrity, we're covered over in shame. But God has wired a man to walk upright, fully exposed, and on full display in front of the world. Males can't do that. It's just not part of their species, but that's what men do. So then the climb, the climb is, is what is really based on your question. You've asked a question about toxic masculinity. <laughs> sorry about that. Toxic masculinity because our culture is attacking masculinity right now. So there is a fight when I climb a mountain, there are certain characteristics of that climb. Suffering, pain, resistance, bargaining, loneliness. And it is hard to it is hard to be a man because being a man means you're doing things. You're carrying a mantle that the women aren't carrying. You have a responsibility that the women don't necessarily have. And you have accountability no matter what our culture tells us before your God uh, to to steward your family and your marriage and your community. And so now, now if you notice both those things I just mentioned, the protecting integrity and fighting apathy, those are really in a lot of ways secular. I mean, anybody's going to go, yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I agree with you. But now let's talk about the summit of manhood. A man does not reach the summit of manhood until he radically gives his life to Jesus. Because here's why, because God created every human. He has a plan for them. He knows how many days they will live. He knows how many breaths they will breathe. The Bible says he thinks of them more than the sands of the seashore. I mean, God has, knows in Jeremiah 1.5, we see that God ordained Jeremiah in the womb, in the womb. He ordained him. So all that to say is this, if God made me, then it makes sense that God does not make junk. He loves me, whether I have autism or whether I'm learning disabled, whatever it is, God made me, and there's something in there for me and those around me. God loves me, and he has a purpose and a plan for my life. So if that is the case, how can I ever become the best version of myself without radical commitment to my creator? And that creator is God and His through his son, Jesus Christ. So to me, when I look at a man, I don't care if you're the president of the United States. I don't care if you're Joe Rogan. I don't care who you are. I go, man, there's so much further that you can go with Jesus, and there's so much more of an impact if you ever would just reach up and lay hold of that summit. The backside of manhood is leading courageously, and this is really where we see men falter. They get casual. They lean back on the descent. They get slippery. They lose traction. Where we need to lean into that downhill slope and gain traction and a lot of the pain that we see in our world today is because males have deferred leadership to men. You know, a, a bio dad defers leadership to a stepdad. A workaholic dad defers leadership to the pastor. You know, you know, over and over we see this deferral 
to a man from a male. And so as men, men lean into their responsibilities. Does that make sense? So Absolutely. It, it, they have to lean into it. It's it's not hard. It's not easy to be a husband. It's not easy to to lead your children. It's not easy to be involved in your community. But but that's what men do. They lead courageously. And then the last point is they finish strong. That men finish what they start. You know, there's this phrase floating around. It makes me want to puke. And it's oh, I retired. You retired. You're 17. You just didn't have good enough grades to play sports, you idiot. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like retire. Hey, we got what we need to realize as men is that an ending is not a finish. A divorce is an end, but a bad finish. A, a suicide is an end, but a bad finish. Getting fired from your job at McDonald's is an end, but not a good finish. So we have to redefine this in a way that we accept responsibility. And I, I'll go back to you know because I my model for finishing is Jesus, right? So every Bible I have has an exclamation mark over John 19.30. It says, Jesus screamed. He said from the cross, it is finished. And I believe he yelled it with a war cry to tell the world that even though he was dying, he's going to finish strong. And so that's what men do. We don't, get, we don't give up. We don't throw in the towel. We're stubborn to the point of we're to blood, sweat, and tears, you know, we don't give up. And that's the difference. A major difference between men and males is that ma males retire. They throw in the towel. They move on to something better. I don't feel it. My marriage is supposed to make me happy. Well, tell me one verse in the Bible that says that. Marriage is supposed to make you holy. So anyway, so that, that when I talk about biblical masculinity, I'm talking about protecting integrity, fighting apathy, pursuing God passionately, leading courageously, and finishing strong. And a man who does that is not toxic because he's crossed over from the species of male to man. Amen. Sorry about that. I get passionate about that topic. Absolutely. That That's what we're here for. Yeah. And I think that's so, that should be at least so comforting for all of the young guys who are yeah. like, they're, they're, it's, I imagine it like when you go onto the internet, you're just taking your little boat out into the ocean. And it's yeah. kind of like the apostles and their tiny little thing going out into the Sea of Galilee. And then here comes this massive storm and you're like, it's just insanity because you're getting thrown back and forth. And so to be able to say, here are the basic principles, the basic morals, the basic ideas that we found this on. And then we build from there our yes. lives, whatever it is, we create stepping stones for ourselves and we don't have to worry about it. It suddenly becomes clear. It becomes peaceful. Because it is a journey. It's like like you said, marriage isn't to make you happy, it's to make you holy. Yep. And nothing hurts more than the process of sanctification. Like Absolutely. It is, it is death to yourself. We read about that over and over in, in the Bible, in the New Testament. You have to die to your flesh. You have to kill it every yep. single day. And it does not feel good. It feels yep. bad. And but we have a lot of people who are who are sliding off because they're giving into that, like exactly what you were saying. Well, we so, live in a world. We live in a world that says it's all about comfort, and that yes. is just antithetical to biblical Christianity. It's not about comfort. It's about suffering. <laughs> it's about pain. It's about pushing yourself. It's about grit. So I appreciate Absolutely. what you had to say just there. Yeah, and and that reminds me too of when Peter talks in I think his first Peter. He's talking about what it what a man needs to have, the qualities that he needs to have to be an elder in the church. And it was a lot of those things that you just listed. Like he has to be a good steward of his family. Because like when you say when a man gets it, everyone wins. It's like if he's getting it at home, if he's he can't lead a church, an entire he can't lead the family of Christ until he's able to lead his family that's just here, physical on earth. There's such a greater, a greater like emphasis and burden that mantle becomes bigger and we know that we are responsible for our leadership when we lead men inside of the church and so i don't i don't want to scare anyone who's like listening like oh my gosh i am not ready for that but we need to start small is my point well and so, and so you, yeah so i wrote a book and it's coming out september of 2020 uh through cook publishing it's called the full capacity man and I lay out the 20 qualities of a biblical spiritual leader as outlined in the pastoral epistles. You said first Peter, but I think you meant first Timothy three and Titus chapter one. And there's 20 qualities, which should be the goal of every man 
to make these 20 qualities. And so that book is coming out in the fall. And uh, yeah, you're right. He has to manage. It's really interesting when you said manage his family well, because I just did a sermon on this Saturday. So the word manage in the Bible is the Greek word proistimai. And it literally means three things. It literally means he is a protector around his family. In other words, he's a wall. It literally means he's a presider over his family. In other words, he's a roof. And it also means he's a provider over his family, which means, which is the rooms. He's providing a place for them. So he's the protector, he's the presider, and he is the provider. So that's what it means to manage his household well. There's a lot to go along with that, and there's a lot of pressure, and God puts the pressure to do that on the man. Yeah. So. Yeah. And we see even in the beginning of the Bible, the first the sin entered the world because the man didn't do his job. Yeah. He he slid off. He relaxed a little too much. And he didn't hold to that integrity that he had been put. And then, like you were saying, he's he's got to walk around all naked and ashamed instead of open and free because he doesn't have any secrets to hide. Well, what's so, interesting, Isaiah, in that passage is that he he sins. He looks at his wife. He's like, oh, my gosh, I'm naked. Oh, my gosh, it's cold outside. I'm experiencing shrinkage. So he starts to bend over, and then they they do what? They make clothes out of what? Remember what they make clothes out of? Fig leaves. Yeah. And then God enters the scene. This is really interesting. Theologically, this is really interesting. God enters the scene, and what does God do? Do you remember what God does? He's kind of like, hey, where are you at? He, yeah, and he goes, whoa, whoa, what's going on? He actually killed an animal and made them clothes out of fur, right? Yeah. So he replaced their their veg their 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 clothing out of fig leaves with an animal sacrifice. Something yeah. died to cover their shame. And it is that one of the very first times in the Bible we see a prophecy to Jesus coming as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The bottom line here is this, sin kills. Yeah, sin kills and it creates shame and guilt. And God comes through Jesus to to cover us of that. But this all goes back to a man who was passive and did not step up to the plate when when his moment came. Yeah. And actually that leads perfectly into the next thing that I want to ask you about family legacy. Mm -hmm. Because when like we're not going to be here in 100 years, but the people who have come from our family lines are going to be here. So when it comes to family legacy, what are the things we should be focusing on now as young people that building towards the future we can have implemented? Because I, I'll back up and I'll share a story. I have had a lot of, I've never experienced loss in my family, but just about the, the close the people who I've always been the closest with and that I've known most closely, deeply connection, like heart to heart, have always been the people who have suffered loss or who have suffered abuse. And so in meeting and interacting with these people, and I've had plenty of my own experience, but I've never had the experience of something happened and it broke me. It's just something happened and it bends me, but I haven't been broken or hurt in this area where there was a lot of stuff happening. There was a lot of abuse, a lot of bad, like male leadership, female leadership from the moms and the dads, even death as results, things like that. And so, I mean, I have a, I have a great family. I come from a good family, a stable family, and that's allowed me to be able to speak into the lives of these other mm -hmm. young men. Some of them are older than me, but maturity is not based on age. And correct, correct. a lot of these young men, have bad habits and they have mindsets and mentalities and things that obviously they need to go and actually get help with those things. They need to spend time in the Bible and writing themselves with God. But to come from a place of that brokenness to a place of healing first, and then from there to a place of actually being able to lead a family in the future is kind of what we're assuming in this, in this situation. Like they're actually going to lead, maybe they're not going to lead a family. But what do you think when it comes to focus, some of the things for those men, either they've been hurt and broken or they're maybe coming from a place of normalcy, but going forwards, they want to say, I need to keep 
some things in the front of my mind that are universal for all young men that are going to be important as I grow and develop into someone who does take on that mantle and that responsibility. Yeah. I would say first thing is this, and I have, I have this in one of my books as a, a Bible study for young guys. If I could go back and tell young guys one thing, it would be this life is way more serious than you think at 19. In other words, let me explain. In other words, the things that I celebrated at 19, and trust me, at 19, I celebrated a lot of things. Those things I celebrated at 19 before I knew Jesus are the things that now I'm ashamed of, and there are the sins I still struggle with. So all of the things that I struggle with at 57 started when I was 14 to 22. Does that make sense? And so yeah. at the, during 14 to 22, we act like, hey, it's all good, I'm young, I'm invincible, but but you will carry the choices you make through life. So that is critical that they understand that because in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, we read, humble yourself, cast, hold on, verse 6, 7, 8. Okay, here we go. I, I hope I got them in out of order. Let me think about this. Cast all your cares up, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. Verse 7, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around seeking for someone to devour. And now if we go back to the Gospel of John, in John chapter 10, verse 10, we have the Jim Ramos life verse. This is my life verse. John 10, 10, B says, <clears throat> Jesus is quoted as saying, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. But if you go back to verse 10, A, he says, your enemy, the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, Jesus put those words together strategically. He comes to steal. He wants to rob your virginity. He wants to rob your purity. He wants to rob your obedience to your parents. He wants to, he wants to take away uh, your relationships. He wants to uh, kill. He wants to kill you. He wants you literally dead. He wants to kill the relationship you have with your parents. He wants to kill the relationship you have you with, that you have with God. But the ultimate thing he wants to do is he wants to destroy you, which means he wants to wipe your legacy out of eternity. He wants you to be the last one that can never lay claim to the name of Jesus. And that goes really goes back to the ancient kings in the Old Testament when a king would come in and conquer another king, oftentimes in the Bible, he would kill the king and all of his offspring to make sure that that bloodline is gone and wiped off the planet forever. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to wipe you out. And so he will do whatever he can to make sure that you are the last one on this planet that ever serves Jesus. So the stakes are really inc are incredibly high. Man, yeah, they definitely are. <laughs> yes, and, they are. Yeah. And that, so that's, so we just got to be careful there, you know, because that's the plan of Satan. But he's going, hey, buddy. And here's the thing about Satan, I'll tell you. It says he prowls around like a roaring lion. I'm a hunter. Anybody who will tell you in hunting, the key to success is to pull game away from the safety of their species. So if you can yeah. separate a duck from the flock, if you can separate an elk from the herd, if you can get a buck to move away and get out away from its protection of the uh, trees, you've got them. And the thing about Satan that's crazy is Satan will wait 60 years to do it. You yeah. may be like, hey, I'm good at 19. God, Satan's going, hey, I don't care. I'll wait till you're 59. I, I'm a patient predator. And so our young guys need to know that. Yeah, that's actually so funny you just said that because I was going to say like, Satan plays the long game. We oh, yeah. have mortal we oh, have mortal yeah. lives here, but he he has eternal life. And so he's yeah. going to be around. He's got all the time in the world and we don't. And so we have to really guard our time. We have to guard Ruslan. I don't know if you're familiar with him online. He's a YouTuber and he talks a lot about our time, talent and treasure. Yep. And so we have to be if we're not guarding our time, we can't invest it into our talents and growing the treasures that we have. Yeah. And so 
by him waiting and stealing and the things that we're focusing on now, we have to have that foresight to be able to say, I want to be a solid person when I'm 50, when I'm 60, when I'm an old man, and all of that time in between. And that starts now and today because there's yep. a lot of things. It takes one choice. It takes one bad, it's like driving a car. It's like, there are so many things you have to do properly and one wrong move can, can just completely end it all. And so you have to have that, that mental foresight and awareness ahead of time. Yeah, you can't get time back. No. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're gonna have a part two coming out very, very soon because we're not done talking with Jim here. This is part one, we'll get part two later. But I want you guys to subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you don't miss when part two comes out because he, we just keep spitting facts. It was amazing. I love talking to Jim so much because he and I think so very similarly. And so to be able to just bounce these things off of him and to have him saying the same things back was just amazing. It was like, ah, oh, this clicks, this works. So I had so much fun recording this with him and I can't wait for you guys to see part two. So subscribe and I will see you guys in the next episode.